epidemic disease was a great concern for 18th century Tennesseans. Uh, they were subject to smallpox outbreaks and outbreaks of cholera, outbreaks of dysentery. People lived with the stark reality of disease-induced death. And this was especially the case in developing urban areas like Memphis, where the sanitation was really poor. In the 1800s, Memphis was a swampy, foul-smelling place. The ground was soaked with excrement of 10,000 families, not to mention their animals. One writer who visited the city said that Memphis was perhaps no better than those of the poorest medieval borough. It was a stinky, foul-smelling place. It was a perfect breeding ground for what would prove to be the deadliest epidemic Memphis had ever seen, yellow fever. Yellow fever originally hit the United States in 1668 in New York and Philadelphia area. It didn't make its way south until 1828 when it first appeared in New Orleans. Within days, it moved upriver and found the perfect breeding ground, swampy, filthy Memphis. And during its first epidemic in 1828, there were 650 cases and 150 deaths. Consider that the population of Memphis at the time was under a thousand people and yet there were 650 cases of this of yellow fever and over a period of 50 years from 1828 to 1879 Memphis had six major yellow fever epidemic outbreaks and they killed over 8,670 people each epidemic was brought north by a steamer from New Orleans often the first symptom of yellow fever was nothing more than a slight chill and within hours victims would suffer headaches temperatures as high as 106 internal bleeding severe pains livers and kidneys would shut down and turn the, the skin yellow and they usually die within two weeks the internal bleeding that would develop mixed with stomach acids would produce a trademark called black vomit it was a nasty, nasty thing. The pain could be so intense that victims were sometimes seen running up and down the streets as if possessed by demons, yelling and screaming and thrashing about. Some who survived the disease still had bodies and minds that were permanently crippled. I want to tell you about the worst of the yellow fever outbreaks in Memphis. It happened in 1878 when we had a really mild winter, a really long spring, and a really hot, scorching summer, which gave us perfect breeding ground for the mosquito that carries the yellow fever. The bad news came on July 27th when newspapers reported in New Orleans that there had been some new cases of yellow fever. Within two weeks, that disease spread northward to Grenada, Mississippi. And even then, a local newspaper said that there was nothing to worry about. It said, whenever yellow fever shows itself, as it is not likely, the Board of Health will promptly report it. Keep cool, avoid patent medicines and bad whiskey. Go about your business as usual. Be cheerful and laugh as much as possible. Some good advice, huh? Memphis officials established checkpoints at major entry points into the city. Quarantine facilities were set up in Germantown and the main facility on President's Island. Passenger ships were blocked from the harbor. Schools were converted to hospitals. Refugee camps were set up. But the efforts at quarantine were not extensive enough and they came a little bit too late. The only sure way of prevention was to escape. And if you could afford to get out of town, you fled. Within 10 days after the very first yellow fever death in 1878, more than half the population fled the city in panic. One writer reported that the masses left by every possible conveyance, by horse, by carriage, by buggies, by wagons, by furniture vans, by flatbed trucks. He wrote that they left by anything that could float on the river and by the railroads. The stream of passengers seemed endless. In July, the city population was about 47,000 people, and within two weeks, 25,000 Memphians had fled the city. 
Of the 19,000 that remained behind, 17,000 contracted yellow fever. That's about 90%. And of those, 5,150 died. So that's over a 30% mortality rate. Out of the 41 police officers Memphis had, only seven were fit for duty. One by one, they fell, dying at their posts. Food and fuel became scarce. Americans from other parts of the country came through with money and provisions, which arrived on steamboats and long trains filled with supplies. People really didn't understand how this disease was spread. Some people thought it was through the air, the poisons and toxins in the air. So even though it was in the summer and there were days over 100 degrees, they would lock themselves in their house, shut the window, shut the door, and keep a fire going in the fireplace to try to burn out all the toxins. In the city, you would hear a cannon go off every once in a while, and that was to uh, disperse the toxins that they thought were in the atmosphere. Others thought that this disease was spread through dead bodies, which makes sense because there were dead bodies piling up all over Memphis every day. There were 200 dead bodies almost every day for a while. And so it was almost a scene like in Monty Python's movie, The Holy Grail, when the guy comes with the cart down through the alley, bring out your dead. And people bring their dead from their homes and pile them on the cart. That was literally what was happening in Memphis. And a lot of those dead bodies ended up here at Elmwood Cemetery. This is a marker for no man's land. And it was a, it's a mass burial site. Bodies would come here and they would just stack up on the ground because it took a long time for the grave diggers to dig the graves. And so they would get them in the ground as fast as they could. And what was intended for uh, paupers and people who couldn't afford a grave site and a funeral, this became the burial place in 1878 for 1,500 people or more. Over 2,000 people are buried here altogether from the epidemics of 1873, 1878, and 1879. There were several heroes in 1878, epidemic of yellow fever in Memphis, doctors and nurses, regular people, and even prostitutes who just stopped what they were doing and concentrated completely on bringing comfort and healing to the sick and the dying. Unfortunately, the same could not be said for the Protestant members of the clergy in Memphis. Unfortunately, there were numerous complaints that the Protestant ministers left the city during the epidemic. And the newspapers reported that Memphians were denouncing the Protestant religious leaders for fleeing the city and ushering their families to safety while leaving their con congregations without support. The Memphis Daily Appeal, which is the forerunner of, forerunner of the commercial appeal, reported that these Protestant ministers, here we go, left their communities to die like dogs without one word of consolation or hope. That is a sound rebuke against people who are supposed to be shepherds taking care of their flocks. But not all the clergy left. There were 16 Catholic priests and 30 Catholic nuns who died in the heroic battle to tend to the sick. The priests and nuns of St. Mary's Episcopal Church also remained here to nurse the sick and comfort the dying. In 1873, a few Episcopalian nuns were sent from New York to Memphis to start a girls' school for St. Mary's Episcopal Church. And just five years later is when this really bad yellow fever epidemic broke out. The nuns set up a soup kitchen and served anybody and everybody all day long. And for 24-7, almost nonstop, without sleep, they were constantly taking care of the poor and the sick. Remember, most of the people who got this disease were poor. Everyone else who could afford to leave left town. So these four sisters and the two Episcopalian priests were constantly on call in and out of people's homes. And they would sit by people's bedside as they really could not do anything for them as far as medicine goes. So they just made them comfortable as best they could. They prayed with them. They cleaned up after them, after this black vomit. They would change their clothes. They would burn their clothes and burn the sheets and do all the washing that they could 
They prayed with him. They comforted him. They just were a healing presence there with the sick and the dying. Even if the people eventually died, their presence, their sacrificial servants' hearts were there to comfort these people and to give peace. St. Mary's Episcopal Church had two priests that died selflessly and sacrificially while serving the sick and dying, as did four of the sisters, Constance, Thecla, Francis, and Ruth. They're all buried here in this marker in Elmwood Cemetery. Constance was only 38 years old. She was mother superior of the nunnery at St. Mary's Episcopal Church. And on September 9th, her final hours before she died, she continued saying, Hallelujah, Hosanna, Hallelujah, Hosanna. Sister Thecla died three days later on September 12th, and she remained conscious up until the very end. One day, a friend came to visit her, and Thecla opened her up her eyes, and with some consternation, said, Oh, why did you come? I was thinking of heavenly things. And she closed her eyes again and murmured, I was with Jesus, and you have disturbed me. And she died right after that. Sister Ruth here, well, she had only been a nun for a year, and the poor were reported saying that she was the sunbeam in the midst of this darkness, and she was only 26 years old when she died. Sister Frances is the one who ran the orphanage, which became a more difficult task as the other sisters died, and she con contracted the disease early on and she came through it, but she had a rebound and she suffered and died on October 1st. These four Episcopalian nuns and the two priests from St. Mary's died of yellow fever. And today they're known as the Martyrs of Memphis or Sister Constance and her companions. The Sisters of St. Mary are honored every year in the Anglican calendar on September 9th. And together, Episcopalians recite this prayer. We give thanks and praise, O God of compassion, for the heroic witness of Constance and her companions, who, in a time of plague and pestilence, were steadfast in their care for the sick and dying, and loved not their own lives, even unto death, inspire in us a like love and commitment to those in need, following the example of our Savior Jesus Christ. I think Constance and her companions, the martyrs of Memphis, can teach us a lot about, about how to take care of people, especially in difficult times. We don't know how bad the epidemic, the pandemic is going to hit Memphis, but we expect that times are going to get difficult, especially economically, if nothing else. And even if this pandemic isn't as bad as the experts warn, there will be difficult times ahead. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. So how do we prepare? How do we plan for that as Christians, as followers of Christ? There's all kinds of advice throughout the New Testament and the whole Bible about how to treat others and how to love others and take care of others. And today we're going to just look at a short few scriptures in Romans chapter 12 verses 9 through 13. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Let's look back at verse 11. It says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. We serve the Lord with zeal and with fervor. How? By being devoted to helping others and to honoring others above ourselves. That's what it says in verses 9 and 10. 
we love is sincere, right? We cling to what is good. We're devoted to one another. We honor one another above ourselves. And this is how we hang on to our zeal and our fervor by, by putting others above ourselves and honoring them. That's good advice no matter what's going on. That's basically the golden rule, right? Treat others the way you want to be treated. Love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 12, it says, be joyful in hope. We can honor others above ourselves and serve others with joy, even in uncertain times and scary times, because our hope is in God. God is our rock. God is our strong tower. Jesus said he would never, ever leave us. He's given us his spirit, the spirit of strength and power, and not of fear and timidity. He will never leave us, and he fills us with joy as we serve, as we put others above ourselves. We can be joyful in hope because God fills us with joy and he fills us with hope. Then we can give hope and we can spread joy to others as we serve them and honor them above ourselves. Then it goes on to say, be patient in affliction. What I'm experiencing right now and what the people around me are experiencing right now, there's not much true affliction. Yes, we're stuck at home a lot. Yes, the kids aren't being shipped off to school, so they're under our feet 24-7. Yes, there is, it's hard to find hamburger meat at the store, not to mention toilet paper or hand sanitizer. Canned goods and non-perishables are in slim supply is but are these things afflictions I think they're more of an inconvenience than affliction I think my generation doesn't know what affliction is as a whole I mean we look at the greatest generation the ones who went through the Great Depression and World War two those people knew affliction and some of them even also went through World War one those people were strong and tough and they were patient in affliction. At least looking back, it sure seems that way. But my generation, not so much. We are impatient with inconvenience. Paul tells us in Romans to be patient with affliction. No matter how bad it gets, we have to be patient. We have to wait on the Lord. And there's really no comparison to what we're going through right now. It may get worse, but right now, there's no comparison to what Memphians are feeling and going through right now uh, to the yellow fever epidemic when so many people died. I'm afraid some of us act like spoiled children uh, because we're inconvenienced. Well, Paul says we need to be patient in affliction. That doesn't mean we sit back and wait it out. He says we should actively serve with zeal and fervor by being devoted to one another and helping one another out and honoring one another above ourselves. That's not, that's not waiting it out. That's not a bored patience. That's an active waiting kind of patience. We can serve others and we can shine the light of Jesus when we joyfully and patiently wait in hope. Then he goes on to say, be faithful in prayer. We wait actively through serving others. We pray. We serve with joy and hope. And we actively wait and we pray. When it says pray faithfully, it means that we pray continually. We don't stop praying. We make that our first go-to prayer. Be faithful in prayer. And in verse 13 it says, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Share. Share with each other. What are our needs? Now, in order to share with each other, we have to know what each other needs. So I want to encourage us to let people know if you have a need so that we can share. Don't let pride get in your way of saying, I need this or I need that. We want to share. We want to help. Most of us got our stimulus checks from the government this week. Tax relief, stimulus checks. 
I want to challenge you with something. I would say most of us have not lost our jobs. Our income has not gone down yet. It might later. But for many of us, this is a surplus. We didn't really need it or count on it. Oh, we can put it to good use. There are lots of things we can do with it. But I want to challenge you to tithe on that stimulus check. Give back to somebody or an organization, a ministry that's trying to help people like Agape or Hope Works. Give back. Maybe the Memphis Food Bank. Give back. Some may even want to go beyond tithing on your check. You may want to sign over the whole thing and dedicate it to helping others. We're called to share with the Lord's people who are in need. And Jesus would go further than that. He would say, it's not just your brothers and sisters in Christ who we need to share with. Your neighbor, who is my neighbor? My neighbor is anyone who has a need. And then Paul finishes in verse 13. He says we need to practice hospitality. Well, that's kind of hard to do in these days. You might think when you're social distancing, you've got to stay six feet away from everybody. You're not supposed to be congregating other than the people in your family. So how do I practice hospitality in times like this? Well, a lot of it is connections. Sharing what you have. Um, offering to go to the store for people. Checking up on people. Sharing your heart with people. Sharing your food with people. Make meals for other people. Stay connected. That's probably the best we can do when it comes to hospitality these days. You know, it's hard to relate to 1873 because they didn't understand where yellow fever came from or how, how you caught it. They didn't know how to treat it. We are so much better situated now with so many more hospitals and doctors and medical professionals and scientific breakthroughs. There's not much need for Christians to sit at the bedside of someone who's dying or to comfort the sick and dying because hopefully they're in a hospital. And right now we can't even go to the hospitals to visit. So it's hard to relate to 1873 and Constance and her companions, the martyrs of Memphis. But still, we must love people. We must love sincerely and do what's good and find ways to be devoted to one another, find ways to love and honor each other above ourselves. And we must serve with spiritual fervor, with zeal. We must be patient while we wait. We've got to be faithful in prayer and joyful in hope and share whatever we have. Share our hearts, our lives, our encouraging words, our gifts, our talents. This is our call as Christ followers. How can we do that today? How can we do that in the coming days? This is our challenge, isn't it? I'm on this journey with you. I pray that we will strengthen each other and hold each other up. That we will not get impatient as we wait, but that we will wait patiently in affliction with joy and love, sincerity, even with fervor and zeal. Father God, Thank you so much, Lord, for people who sacrifice, who are selfless and give themselves away to help others. Would you show us how we can do that also, God? How we can help our neighbor, how we can give out of our abundance to help those who are hurting. Even if it's not directly to a person, but we can give to ministries and organizations that are on the front lines. Thank you, God, for this family of believers that you put me in. And I, I pray that you increase our love for you, and you increase our love for one another, and you increase our love for the hurting, the poor, and the sick. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.